how many of you consider yourselves to be good drivers? Good, good. I do as well. I probably have an overinflated opinion of myself as a driver, as many of us often do. But I also have to admit there have been a few times in my life where I have been in a car accident. I know, I know, it's a surprise, it's a shock. But several of those times, I was actually not at fault. Several, I may have been. Um, but one time in particular is one of the most interesting because I was both a witness to an accident and a participant in the accident at the same time. In fact, it was myself and my wife, Akiko, um, we experienced this together. Um, this was about 11 years ago. We were living in Jackson, Mississippi at the time. And I'll kind of sketch out how, how this all transpired because it was, really, it was really fascinating and scary at the same time. So we were parked, or not parked, but we were stopped at a red light um, at an intersection. So here we are. Here's the, the cross street in front of us. It's in a major thoroughfare in the city of Jackson. And we have the red light. The green light is going with the traffic in front of us. And actually what's happening at the moment is that the cars on our right side are making a left turn toward us. So they've got a, a green turning arrow of some sort. And the cars going the other direction have also a red light, ostensibly. We're stopped. Cars are turning left. Someone coming from the other direction, however, either is not paying attention or just decides they don't want to obey the rules. They go right through that red light. So this is a bit frightening because the car making the left turn can't get out of the way as this other car basically barrels into them. And then we, at the stoplight, can't go anywhere. We're not moving. Well, we can't back up. We can see this happening in front of us. There's cars behind us. We're literally pinned. And so this all begins to transpire in what feels like slow motion because it's this inevitability that you just can't change, all happening literally in front of you. So we are witnessing it, and we're also experiencing it at the same time. Now, fortunately, even though there was quite a bit of damage done to the cars, and the force of the impact knocked the car that got hit directly into us in a front-end collision, and there was quite a bit of body work done um, that needed to be done to get our Buick back up and running, um, no one was hurt. It really was a miracle with all of the damage done to the three cars that day. And it was, like I said, one of the most interesting experiences because it's not often that you can have a front row seat and explain to the police and the highway patrol exactly what happened because you saw it all happen in front of you and you are probably one of the best witnesses and at the same time you were in the middle of it and you got hit too. Now, another interesting footnote to this story because it says something a little bit about our society, at least it says something about Mississippi. Um, and that was, when they were filling out the accident report and having to fill out the paperwork, my wife was in the front passenger seat, I was in the driver's seat. They were filling out this um, kind of demo, uh, <laughs> demographic information about who was in the car, names and addresses and all of that kind of thing, but also their race. But there was only three options. There was white, black, or other. I thought that's interesting, um, because after all, this was like 2011. This wasn't 1955. Um, and my wife is Japanese, and so she was trying to explain, because the officer was asking, well, well what race are you? And she's like, I'm Japanese. <laughs> and he's like, oh, OK, well, other. And she's like, I'm not really other. I'm, you know, do you have an Asian or something there? And he's like, no, just other is fine. And she's like, no, that's kind of not fine. I mean, I don't like just being dismissed like this. And he's like, oh, don't, don't worry about it. It's just, it's just paperwork. Well, which is kind of true, but at the same time, it's interesting how in our society we still live with this kind of binary 
reality, right, of black and white, at least in Mississippi. And here it was, someone who was a witness was also literally made invisible by the paperwork that we were filling out. And so even her, her witness, her voice, wasn't really even recognized in the same way. So witnesses are an important part of our society and our legal system. And we tend to trust the word of those who were present on the scene of an accident. And when it is an accident or an encounter with a celebrity or someone who just attended that church council gathering that you missed last week or that you might miss this coming week, we believe the one who was there. We tend to trust what they have to say. Even our legal system gives a certain level of credence to eyewitnesses. Maybe not necessarily with a conviction in a court, but certainly when it comes to gathering evidence, eyewitness accounts are important. And a witness brings authenticity and passion. A witness brings us closer and allows us access to what really happened. This text this morning from the book of Acts gives us the same sense of witness. It is the testimony, if you will, of one who was there. These are the sharp, poignant memories of someone who was present on the scene, a witness. And that's just the point. This whole Easter event defies rationality. Easter is unsettling because it's unnatural. People don't just get up and walk away after they've been crucified. And so to have a community begin to share this story just doesn't make sense. It's disturbing on so many levels. Are these people crazy? Are they dangerous? Why are they saying this? Could this have happened? No, this could, well, could it? No, it could, could it? It is incredibly unsettling. And that's an understatement because Easter is unsettling for the world. We need to be witnesses to the Easter event, witnesses in every sense of the word, witnesses to not only what we believe happened, but what we know happened to us and continues to happen to us. Because as Christians, Easter happens every year in new ways in our own lives. And that's what we witness to as well. Peter declares in his defense before the council, we are witnesses. They told him that he wasn't supposed to teach in the name of the crucified one, and yet he did. He says we saw something, and we have to talk about it. We participated in something, and we have to tell the story. More than that, he says we became something through our encounter and our relationship with Jesus, and there is nothing we can do but be proclaimers of that word. We are witnesses does not simply mean they are telling what they saw or what happened to them. It also means that they have now become something new, something more, and they have to live out that proclamation every day of their lives. It is their new identity. As Christians, we are a resurrection people. This is not just something we believe. This is something we are, something we live out to. To witness to that means to put that reality into action. With every word, every encounter, every action, they are witnessing, we are witnessing to that which defines our lives in a new and profound way. You can almost picture Peter's confusion as they challenge him on this point. In his mind, they are telling him to stop breathing, telling him to stop being Peter. He's not angry. He's not belligerent or defiant. He just is who he is, as if his simple statement explains it all. We are witnesses. This is who we are, Your Honor. We are witnesses. It is our life's purpose, the meaning of our existence. 
Just like Jesus said on Palm Sunday, when he said the very stones would cry out, it is what we do and what we will do despite the impediments that might be thrown in front of us. And neither is Peter pleading for his life, asking to be let off with good or at least explainable behavior. He is wise enough to know that judges are going to do what judges are going to do. Courts and laws are going to do what the status quo demands that they do. Likewise, he declares, we are going to do what we are going to do. Get used to it. Well, he doesn't really say get used to it, but he doesn't need to. It's implied in that statement of fact, we are witnesses. Simple. Well, no, maybe not all that simple. It's the opposite of simple, as Peter himself will discover as he continues to walk this path, as we are discovering, as we seek to be made disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. It is simple. We are witnesses. But it is not easy. Living every day representing the one you proclaim with your words, living a life of hospitality and invitation, a life geared towards reconciliation and grace. No, it isn't easy. Russian Orthodox priest, the Reverend John Burden, has recently been outspoken in his pulpit about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Finally hauled into the local police station, he was fined about 420 U.S. dollars in a ruling that accused him of, quote, discrediting the use of the armed forces of the Russian Federation, end quote. In a recent post, Burden appeared to, to decry and criticize a speech delivered by President Putin at a March 18th rally in support of the war. During his address, Putin paraphrased the Bible to laud Russia's troops, saying, there is no greater love than giving up one's soul for their friends. Burden responded, I don't know what was more, illiteracy or blasphemy in the speech of the president, who tried with the gospel words, there is no greater love as if someone gave his life for his friends, to justify the bloody madness that the whole world has been watching for the second month now already. What is striking, however, is the approving chorus on the part of the priesthood and some of the laity following that performance. Being a witness for truth in the face of opposition is not easy. Yet Reverend Burden framed his actions as a requirement of his Christian faith. Your job is not to change, but to testify, he wrote. Asked if he was concerned that Russian authorities would find and punish him for his posts, Burden was defiant. There is a Russian proverb, if you are afraid of wolves, don't go into the forest, he said. When asked again a little bit later, Burden invoked Psalm 27, the Lord is my enlightenment and my savior, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defender of my life, whom shall I fear? The religious leaders in our scripture reading for today should not have been too surprised by the disciples' defense any more than Reverend Burden's superiors should have been. These followers of Jesus had all already been arrested for teaching in the temple about Jesus and his resurrection. The leaders had already heard Peter and John speaking for all the disciples when they said that they could not stop speaking about such things. Not surprisingly, the disciples continued to preach and teach in the temple, and not surprisingly, the high priests had them arrested again. The leader's accusation against the disciples is also not surprising. They seem bothered by several things. Their authority has not been obeyed. 
They did not get their way simply by virtue of their status, their social religious position, their titles, and their vociferous demands. Some politicians, and maybe even some pastors, that we could probably name likewise seem to expect that their every declaration will bring unquestioning conformity. These leaders seem bothered that this situation is getting more and more out of hand. The message about Jesus, which they had hoped to stop first with the Roman cross and then with repeated orders and jail cells, now seems to be filling Jerusalem. It has gone viral, and we know how difficult it can be to pull such things back into manageable limits. The leaders have lost their ability to control and manage, and they are now sounding a bit desperate. We might even know what that's like when Jesus seems to be set loose in our lives and he starts calling and sending us to unmanageable ministry. What challenges face our community that need a word or a presence from a faith community? What actions or statements might be made to show where we are standing and whom we are standing with in this complicated environment? Just as the early church in Acts is figuring out who they needed to be, we are exploring right now what it means to be witnesses in a post-pandemic, post-modern, post-Christendom world. We're even the United Methodist Church is changing, and we are too. With the advent of new technology, a new political landscape, unrest in world affairs, weather and climate doing all kinds of strange things, the world in which we live, this world in which we live, has never existed before. We are at a unique point in world history, which is incredibly exciting and terrifying. But in both instances, the exciting part and the terrifying part, it is full of opportunities for faith and for witness. You see, discipleship is lived in the midst of the clash between the kingdom's version of the world as God would have it and the version of the world pursued by other powers that we encounter in our daily lives. And when you stand up to such powers in what you claim as the faithful opposition, how do you know that you aren't simply projecting your own desires, your own prejudices, your own politics onto God, when in fact... You're just simply serving yourselves. This is a question all of us as disciples need to ask ourselves constantly for accountability. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, believed heavily in spiritual accountability because those who have the power to affect social change in the name of faith also have the power to do great damage if they are not humble and if they are not holding themselves accountable. Like this meme that was recently on Facebook. We want the war horse. Jesus rides a donkey. We want the eagle. The Holy Spirit descends as a dove. We want to take up swords. Jesus takes up a cross. We want the roaring lion. God comes as a slaughtered lamb. We keep trying to arm God. God keeps trying to disarm us. Perhaps Peter's reference to God raising Jesus is key here. When God promises and accomplishes is life rather than death. Freedom rather than confinement Repentance and forgiveness rather than murder and revenge. That is the kingdom to which the church is still called to bear witness in words and actions. We are witnesses to a faith tradition that is growing 
changing, reimagining itself, and speaking to a whole new world. We have begun a transition that we simply cannot abandon when it gets tough, or when we don't fully understand it, or when it's just more convenient to let the busyness of life take over. In the 1968 Summer Olympic Games, John Stephen Aquari of Tanzania was entered in the marathon. He suffered an injury during the race, but he persevered in the darkness on the streets of Mexico City all alone as the other runners left him behind. An hour after the race was over, he hobbled into the darkened stadium, his right leg bandaged in two places, grimacing with every step. The few thousand spectators who were lingering in the stadium noticed him and began to applaud as he limped around the track. When he finally stumbled across the finish line, holding his leg with both hands, the crowd erupted. Filmmaker Bud Greenspan asked Aquari after the race, why did you do this? You were in such pain. You couldn't possibly win. The runner looked at the filmmaker as if he was crazy and answered, Mr. Greenspan, I don't think you understand. My country did not send me 5,000 miles to start the race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. How do you measure greatness when you finish last? What kept him going, painful stride after painful stride? A great vision kept him going. He wasn't running for himself. He was running for his country. How about running, sacrificing, and serving for Jesus? How about running for the gospel, which means not running for any one country, but running for the entire world? The gospel, after all, is good news for the whole world. The good news that God has triumphed over evil in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and is bringing to the world his healing, loving rule. How about connecting with that vision? There's no denying it. We are, as Peter submits, all witnesses. Imagine a whole church full of Christians with the enthusiasm and vigor of people who have been there, people who have seen the reality and the power of the resurrection. Let us embrace Christ's rising and let us breathe in the passion and the power of the new life that has been offered to us. Let us step up to the plate as witnesses who can testify to the power and the wonder, the reality of new life in Christ Jesus. For even when we are cut down, we are unstoppable. Amen.